let's read the following quote together. The French have already discovered that the blackness of the skin is no reason why human beings should be abandoned without redress to the caprice of a tormentor. It may come one day to be recognized that the number of legs, the velocity of the skin, or the termination of the os sacrum are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace this insuperable line? Is it the faculty of reason, or perhaps the faculty for discourse? The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? The preceding quotation is excerpted from Jeremy Bentham's Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, published in 1789. Bentham was a great friend of James Mill, father of John Stuart Mill, so you won't be surprised to learn that Jeremy and James were the two that got John Stuart Mill into the philosophy of utilitarianism. Bentham's Point Utilitarianism's creed that one should seek the greatest happiness for the greatest number should not be restricted to human beings. Rather, it should extend to all sentient beings, that is, to all beings capable of suffering or experiencing pleasure. Typically, utilitarians agree about this. Since animals can suffer and feel pleasure or happiness, their interests should be factored into the utilitarian calculus. Sentient just means able to feel or perceive. Here is a utilitarian argument for treating animals well. Premise 1. You should do what brings about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of sentient beings. Premise 2. Actions that harm animals often fail to bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of sentient beings. Conclusion, therefore, those actions that harm animals are morally wrong. Here's a puzzle for utilitarians. When I began teaching as a teaching assistant at the end of the 1980s, I found an article about a gorilla, Ivan, that was kept in a cage at the mall. Finally, after 27 years, he was being sent to a better home in the Atlanta Zoo. Living in the cage at the mall didn't give him much room to move around or much fun to have. He tended to pace back and forth most of the day. However, his presence in that cage did give lots and lots of children who visited the mall pleasure, thousands upon thousands, over 25 years. So didn't keeping him in the cage ultimately produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number? You see the problem. Why should it be that we believe a moral theory that says it's okay to mistreat one being simply because a bunch of other beings get pleasure from it? Well, John Stuart Mill has an answer. Unlike Bentham, Mill distinguishes not just the quantity of pleasures, but the quality. Some pleasures are cheap, low-grade pleasures, while others are high-grade. In this case, the mall gorilla was giving kids lots of pleasure, but it was cheap, low-grade pleasure. And, unfortunately, the pain that the gorilla experienced was high-grade suffering. To prove the point, Mill asks this. Suppose you could be hooked to a machine and get 100 million units of child scene gorilla pleasure, but in order to get it, you'd have to give up the pleasure, less in quantity, that you get from being free to come and go as you please. Would you? Mill thinks most will say no, so the child seeing gorilla pleasure is cheap, low-grade pleasure. Sometimes I like to joke about marijuana, but I've never smoked marijuana. And I, I mean that, I promise that's the truth. Um, now, I joke about it, but that's because it is true that in college, I experimented with some Cheech and Chong albums, so 
I like the drug humor, but I have never used drugs. So I don't want it to be like you say, oh, well, he's cool and he uses marijuana. And then you go out and get hooked on marijuana because, you know, because I don't. If you want to be cool like me, don't use marijuana. Um, but <clears throat> that being said, the reason I'm telling you this is I want to give you an example that involves uh, marijuana. So the example goes like this. Um, imagine you have two bags of marijuana and let's pretend they have equal amounts. So uh, the, they're equal in quantity, but that doesn't mean that they're equal because they could be different in quality. This could be pure Colombian gold, the good stuff, Whereas this is ditch weed. You know, I found this growing by the train tracks. So just because they're the same in quality doesn't mean they're the same in quantity. Now, where is that? Oh, I don't, didn't bring the jar in here, but it's oregano, folks. <laughs> this isn't marijuana. So with Mill's distinction in mind, we can give this revised utilitarian argument for treating animals well. Premise one. You should do what brings about the greatest high quality happiness for the greatest number of sentient beings. Premise two, keeping the gorilla in the cage at the mall failed to bring about the greatest high grade happiness for the greatest number of sentient beings, even though it produced a lot of low grade happiness for human beings. So therefore, keeping the gorilla in the cage at the mall was morally wrong. So see how this works. Um, it's true that keeping the gorilla in the cage all those years produced a net greater amount of pleasure, but even though it produced an amount of pleasure that was greater in number, it wasn't the greatest amount of high quality pleasure. In other words, the high quality suffering that the gorilla experienced outweighed the cheap low-grade, low-quality pleasure that the kids got from looking at the gorilla. Because think about what that pleasure is like. It's just a momentary, ooh, neat, you know, kind of an excitement. But that doesn't outweigh genuine deep suffering, which is what the gorilla felt. And now we move to Immanuel Kant's view on animals. Maybe Kant's categorical imperative, when extended to animals, will give us an argument for respecting them. However, Kant himself thought we have no direct duties to animals. But so far as animals are concerned, we have no direct duties. Animals are not self-conscious and are there merely as a means to an end. That end is man. Our duties toward animals are merely indirect duties toward humanity. Thus, if a dog has served his master long and faithfully, his service, on the analogy of human service, deserves reward, and when the dog has grown too old to serve, his master ought to keep him until he dies. Such an action helps to support us in our duties toward human beings, where they are bounden duties. If he is not to stifle his human feelings, he must practice kindness toward animals, for he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealing with men. Think about all those movies where you, you see the, uh, the serial killer starts out killing animals when he's young, like he kills the family pet. And that's actually true. Like they've found that uh, people who are serial killers usually have a history of animal abuse too. So that's Kant's point. He thinks the reason it's wrong for you to bury a kitty cat up to its neck and then run over its head with a lawnmower, that kind of thing, those acts of cruelty uh, are they're wrong because they'll make it more likely that you'll do something like that to a human, that you'll be abusive toward humans. If I were to poke Carissa, my dog, with a fork, oh yeah, she doesn't like that idea, but if I poked her with a fork, well then that means it's more likely that I'm gonna, 
you know, stalk one of you guys, I've got your addresses, you know, and break into your apartment and then start stabbing you with the fork. So, I mean, I wouldn't really do that, of course, but you get the point is that if I started with the dog, I'm probably coming for you next. So the Kantian argument about animal welfare goes like this. Premise one, always treat self-conscious beings not as mere means, but as an end. Premise two, animals are not self-conscious. Conclusion, therefore you have no direct duty to treat them well. However, we still have Kant's indirect duty argument about animal welfare. Premise one, if you don't treat animals with respect, then you are more likely to treat humans without respect. Premise two, but you should always act in ways that make it more likely you will treat others not as mere means but as ends. That is to say, you should do what makes it more likely that you will treat humans with respect. Conclusion, therefore you should treat animals with respect just to get into a habit that will make you treat humans with respect.